Hi there. Welcome to this short talk on the sonographic assessment of pulmonary hypertension. My name is Andrea Robinson. I'm one of the critical care ultrasound fellows at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. Thank you for listening. I have no specific disclosures to report. Uh, we're going to talk about pulmonary hypertension today, and for the most part, the information first shared in this presentation is consistent uh, with the guidelines and recommendations of the American and British societies of echocardiography. So let's talk about briefly about pulmonary hypertension. Strictly speaking, it's a diagnosis that can only be made on right heart catheterization when the pressures in the pulmonary artery can be directly measured. There, it is defined as a mean pulmonary artery pressure greater than 25 millimeters of mercury. And this remains the gold standard for diagnosing and monitoring pulmonary hypertension. The many causes of pulmonary hypertension, particularly chronic pulmonary hypertension, are well beyond the scope of this talk, although the WHO groupings are listed here for your reference. We will not go into the details of these, though we will mention some causes which are either unique to or common in ICU patients. Today, we'll be focusing on markers of pulmonary hypertension, which can be assessed by echocardiography. Although categories and criteria exist for grading the severity of pulmonary hypertension, recent guidelines have generally moved away from these imprecise measures. Instead, we will be looking for markers that either increase the probability of pulmonary hypertension being present or not. This talk will be divided into two parts. First, we'll discuss how we can assess for the presence of pulmonary hypertension on echocardiography. And second, we will look for sequelae of pulmonary hypertension, namely right ventricular dysfunction and failure. And the second part of this is of particular interest in the, in the ICU, as many patients will either come in with or develop right ventricular dysfunction while in critical care. Uh, so we will look at the role of the RVSP and, and PA interrogation in determining the likelihood of pulmonary hypertension being present, and then we will discuss the markers of RV dysfunction. Some of these require advanced echo techniques, but many, particularly the assessment of RV function, can be acquired with base, standard basic cardiac views. As I mentioned, this talk will be divided into two parts, and today we'll be focusing on uh, the markers that suggest uh, pulmonary hypertension, and in a separate video we will look at markers that suggest the presence of RV dysfunction. It's important to note that this is not meant to replace comprehensive echocardiography performed by cardiologists to assess cardiac structure and function. Rather, these are tools that we can use at the bedside in critical care to assess the rapidly evolving clinical realities of our patients and to, and to assess the impact of our interventions on the hemodynamics of our patients. So let's get to it. Let's start by looking at the RV systolic pressure also referred to as the PA systolic pressure in some institutions. The basic assumption here is that in order to generate forward flow during systole, the pressure in the right ventricle must be equal to or greater than the pressure in the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery, although not impossible to find on echo, as we'll talk about shortly, is nonetheless harder to visualize than the right ventricle. If there were a way to estimate the pressure in the RV, we could use it as a surrogate for the pulmonary pressures. This is where the tricuspid regurgitant jet and the RVSP come in. It is possible to estimate the pressure in the RV by looking at the force of the TR jet generated against the closed tricuspid valve during systole. The assumption being that the higher the pressure, the faster or more intense the TR jet will be. By measuring the velocity across the valve via continuous wave spectral Doppler, um, as you see here, you can infer the pressure being generated uh, in the right ventricle. We'll get to the specifics of how we do this in, in a moment. One important note, you must add the right atrial pressure to this estimate as the pressure in the right atrium acts as the backstop to the TR jet. We'll come back to this in a moment also. There are some important caveats to talk about um, that you have to keep in mind. First, this measure is unreliable in patients with pulmonary stenosis, which fortunately is rare outside the congenital heart disease population, as the pressure generated in the RV during this time reflects the force required to get through the stenotic valve rather than that required to overcome the pressures in the pulmonary artery. Second, to get an accurate reading, you must measure the jet in line with its highest flow. The CW Doppler will measure the highest velocity along the axis on which it is placed. 
If your TR jet is more than 15 to 20 degrees off from this axis, you cannot be sure you are acquiring the correct velocities. This can happen if the angle at which you're holding the probe is not correct, or with an eccentric TR jets angled away from your probe. Third, it's possible that there simply isn't enough blood regurgitating across the valve to generate a spectral waveform. Conversely, it's also possible that the TR is so severe, so-called wide open uh, regurgitation, in which your velocity is artificially low, uh, because simply because there's no pressure gradient against which it is generated. Fourth, remember that if the right ventricle is severely dysfunctional, it will not be able to generate enough force to, t uh, to create a TR jet in systole. And finally, it is important to recall that your estimate of the right atrial pressure will almost always be imprecise. Unless, of course, you have a central line in the internal jugular vein and you are directly transducing the, CV, the central venous pressure. Now that we're keeping some of this context in mind, let's take a look at how we will go about measuring the RVSP. There are four standard views from which you can acquire an appropriately on-axis view of the tricuspid valve. The first is the parasternal inflow view, which is obtained in the same window as your parasternal long axis with the probe angled downwards to capture the, to capture the tricuspid valve. This is generally considered an advanced view and not one that you'll often be looking for. A more common view is the parasternal short axis at the level of the aortic root. This will allow you to visualize both the tricuspid and pulmonic valves. Likely the most common view that you will be using is the apical four-chamber, which gives an excellent view of the RV inflow tract and is one of the standard bedside cardiac ultrasound views. Finally, you can sometimes acquire an adequate view of the tricuspid valve in the subcostal short axis. However, it's not often that the regurgitant jet will be well aligned with your probe. Once you've got an adequate view of the flow through the tricuspid valve, um, you can use the color Doppler to assess for regurgitant jet, paying attention to the direction of incination and the Nyquist limit. Um, a continuous wave Doppler can then be traced through the densest part of the jet to acquire the signal. This will give you an envelope, which corresponds to the velocity of blood flow at that point. Generally speaking, we are interested in the maximum velocity of the TR jet. We can infer from this how much effort the right ventricle is using to push against the pulmonary vasculature. The more resistant it is, the more force the RV must use, and the greater the velocity of the TR jet will be. A velocity that is less than 2.8 meters per second is considered normal, while a velocity greater than 3.4 meters per second is highly suggestive of pulmonary hypertension. If it is between 2.8 and 3.4 meters per second, we will likely have to rely on other markers to support or refute the possibility of pulmonary hypertension. We can also translate this maximum velocity into a pressure gradient via the simplified Bernoulli equation, which relies on a bunch of very complex fluid dynamics that are well beyond the scope of this talk to generate this formula, which indicates that the pressure gradient is four times the square of the maximum velocity. Most machines will actually do this calculation for you. It is possible to use the velocity time integral as well of this jet to derive the same calculation. Some experts believe that this is a more accurate, if slightly more time consuming way of deriving this information. Once we have our pressure gradient, we need only to complete our estimate of the right atrial pressure uh, in order uh, to get our final RVSP, as the true RVSP is the pressure gradient across the tricuspid valve plus the pressure in the right atrium. The easiest way to do this is to assess the size and collapsibility index of the IVC. The best way of acquiring an image is via the subcostal view, incinating the IVC as it passes through the liver. Look to make sure that you follow it to see it's emptying into the right atrium and that you can see the hepatic vein emptying into the IVC. In this way, you can distinguish it from the other large vessel passing through the abdomen, which is the aorta. Once you have identified the correct structure, you can use M mode to more easily measure it. Place your M mode cursor approximately one to two centimeters back from the RA inlet. You can, you can then get a one-dimensional image of everything in that specific line over time. The large anechoic structure in the center there is the blood-filled IVC. You can see over time as the patient breathes how the diameter varies. Measure the diameter at its maximum and minimum sizes. 
The difference between the two represents your collapsibility index. Remember that the timing of IVC diameter change will vary based on whether the patient is mechanically ventilated or not. In spontaneously breathing patients who are relying on negative pressure ventilation, the IVC will collapse on inspiration as the negative pressure generated in the thorax creates a gradient promoting flow towards the RA. In mechanically ventilated patients on positive pressure ventilation, the IVC will increase during inspiration as the increased intrathoracic pressure will create an obstruction to flow. Once you have measured your collapsibility index and size, you can estimate uh, right atrial pressure. By convention, here are the pressures that are inferred. Please note that the degree, expected degree of collapsibility is much higher in spontaneously breathing patients than in patients on positive pressure ventilation. There are many reasons why this is an inaccurate estimate, including the effects of intra-abdominal pressures, whether an intubated patient is triggering the ventilator or not, and several more. But remember, we are only trying to get a sense of whether pulmonary hypertension is likely to be present, not to measure the actual pulmonary pressures. That said, just to get us uh, um, used to looking at pulmonary pressures, um, here are uh, here is an example of uh, a continuous wave Doppler through a tricuspid uh, regurgitant jet. You can see based on the cursor that is placed here, that the maximal velocity uh, of this uh, TR jet is about 450 centimeters uh, per second or 4.5 meters per second, well above our 3.4 threshold that we discussed. This generates um, a pressure gradient of 81 uh, and add that to an estimated right atrial pressure of 5 and you end up with an RVSP of 86. Um, making it highly probable that this patient has pulmonary hypertension. And just to get us used to looking at RVSP pressures, here are some of the older severity categorizations. As you can see in this table, RVSPs of 45 and lower are far less significant than RVSPs greater than this. In the example that we just saw, an RVSP of 86 makes it quite likely that this patient has severe pulmonary hypertension. Now let's move on to the assessment of the pulmonary artery itself. Because we've covered some of the underlying concepts already, we'll be able to go through this a little bit faster. Here are a few of the, uh, there are a few measurements that we will look at specifically, some of which are direct measurements of the pulmonary artery itself, while others are measurements of the, of the spectral Doppler findings. As with the assessment of the TR jet, there are a few different sonographic windows which are well suited to the interrogation of the pulmonary artery. One is the RV outflow view acquired in the parasternal long axis by angling the probe upwards. The other two are the short axis view as at the level of the aortic valve and in the subcostal, short eye, uh, uh, subcostal window. Uh, they're essentially the same view acquired either parasternally or in the subcostal window. Both are possibilities and which you use will vary patient to patient depending on which windows are the most optimized. The short axis view also allows us to see the pulmonary artery, sometimes right up to the bifurcation into the left um, and uh, right main uh, arteries. In this case, you can measure the diameter of the pulmonary artery itself. This is done in diastole when the artery is relaxed midway between the pulmonary valve and the bifurcation. As you know, unlike the left-sided circulation, the right-sided vessels have low resistance and are far more compliant. As such, the pressure, as the pressure in these arteries increase as a downstream effect of either pre or post capillary hypertension, the artery itself enlarges. A pulmonary artery with a diameter greater than 2.5 centimeters is highly suggestive of associated pulmonary hypertension. The next thing we'll look at is the pulmonary artery acceleration time. Conceptually, this is relatively simple. Looking at the spectral Doppler waveform in the right ventricular outflow tract, uh, we will measure the time from onset of flow i.e. the beginning of systole, to the peak velocity. This is the time spent accelerating, also known as the acceleration time. The premise of this is that the higher the pressures in the pulmonary artery, the faster the pressures between the RV and the PA will equalize, and the shorter um, uh, that acceleration time will be. So from any of our views, you can place a pulse wave Doppler immediately before the pulmonary valve in the RVOT. This will show you the flow out of the RVOT at that specific point. If you measure the time from onset to peak, this corresponds to the acceleration time. 
a time of less than 105 milliseconds suggests the presence of pulmonary hypertension. Many of the same caveats apply to the acceleration time as to the RVSP. Your image must be acquired on access and severe RV failure will falsely alter this measurement. One caveat to remember is that this measurement is best validated at a heart rate of 70 to 100, as well as at end expiration. If your patient's heart rate is outside this range, a correction factor ex exists, as shown here. Uh, incidentally, this is also the, trace spectral, uh, the spectral tracing we will use to measure the RVOT VTI and assess some markers of RV function, but we'll talk about this more when we talk about markers of RV dysfunction. Finally, we will briefly discuss the interrogation of a pulmonary artery jet if one is present. Applying the exact same logic we did in our discussion on the RVSP, we know that the force, so to speak, of the PI jet will be generated by the pressures in the pulmonary artery during diastole. The density and size of the jet are reflective of the severity of the regurgitation, but the velocity generated is reflective of the pressure driving it, particularly in early diastole. To this end, a velocity of more than 2.2 meters per second in early diastole suggests that there is pulmonary hypertension derived, driving it. Uh, the pressure gradients, calculated by the same Bernoulli equation as we, we previously discussed, will reflect the mean PA pressures in early diastole, and in late diastole, when the pressures have equalized, they will represent the PA diastolic pressure. Remember that like when we calculated the RVSP, we have to add in our estimate of the right atrial pressure, and for the exact same reason. Um, the, R, the right atrial pressure, which will reflect the RV pressure when the tricuspid valve is open in diastole, will act as the backstop for the pressure gradient out of the uh, pulmonary valve. We mentioned at the beginning that a mean PA pressure of more than 25 millimeters of mercury defines pulmonary hypertension, and now you have a way to estimate it. Using all of these methods and keeping in mind the caveats we've discussed, we can derive estimates of PA systolic, diastolic, and mean pressures in our efforts to answer the question, is pulmonary hypertension present? The next question we will ask is about the consequences of pulmonary hypertension, specifically RV dysfunction and failure. This will be the subject of part two of this video. I'd like to end by uh, thanking Drs. Brian Buchanan and Leon Biker, as well as the Critical Care Ultrasonography Program at the University of Alberta uh, uh, for allowing me to use some of their images, uh, as well as providing feedback on this talk. Thank you.